Ready? Okay. Hello. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Martin Ferrari, Tincho. Uh, I'm going to present you this system uh, I've been working with as a Debian maintainer, um, yeah, packager. Also a bit involved in upstream, but not too much. Uh, which I'm presenting here because I think it's very interesting system, very different to most to what most people know about monitoring. Uh, it's based on a talk we gave together with Stefan sitting here in the Broom Lab, Broom Lab hackerspace in Prague a month ago. <coughs> I am sysadmin for a long time, and after I came back into working as sysadmin after um, a gig in a company with a lot of closed source products, I was uh, struggling to find a good monitoring system, and this for me was so interesting, so good, that I wanted to share with you. If this works. Okay. Mm. Okay. So who's Prometheus? Prometheus is this dude who stole the fire from Mount Olympus and gave it to humanity, according to myth, which might or not be uh, a r some relation with the project itself. If you know what I mean. <coughs> so what is Prometheus? Prometheus is not Nagios. That's the main thing to know. Has, it's a completely different way of looking at monitoring. We are used to the Nagios states of good, bad, or worse, which, which is bad warning or okay, um, which is not really useful when you want to understand what's going on, uh, when you want to prevent problems before they appear. Um, it's two cores. Uh, it's only using very basic checks, usually, or complex checks that are encoded into script that only gives three states. And many monitoring systems are like that. Has scalability problems, um, which I hear, I hear that I think uh, I think it's his name is uh, trying to improve, but it still has has some issues with that. Uh, and as I was saying, you don't understand what's going on. You get an alert at 3 in the morning. Uh, the web server is returning 500 errors, but it's difficult to, to track what's going on. So maybe you go to another tool that will show you graphs, try to correlate the stuff or go to logs, and many different things you need to, to do usually when you're dealing with an alert that are not integrated. There are some new systems, uh, like New Relic, that are very much in vogue these days. Uh, all these cloud-based automatic systems that do a lot of things for you will provide you nice graphics. Uh, we we'll get a lot of data from your applications. In fact, the idea is that you install this more or less proprietary library in your, in your project, and you will automatically get information about the health of it, which is called instrumentation. instrumentation sorry. Um, but then you get these nice consoles, and then if you, when you want to do stuff with it, it's not so easy. Uh, the data is not controlled by you. Uh, you have to depend, to assume that they will be, be always up. Um, getting the data out of it is not easy. So it's not the kind of system I'm comfortable with. Mention instrumentation. Uh, for me, it was a new concept a few years back. Um, maybe for other people it's more, more known nowadays. The idea is that uh, you put uh, hooks everywhere in your application or in your service uh, that will measure stuff, whatever. Maybe number of requests from an HTTP server, time spent in a specific function, you name it. That's up to you. The nice thing about the systems like New Relic is that they will do that automatically for you, some kind of black magic install this library and they will uh, instrument everything, uh, offer some value of everything. Java has the JMX um, framework that will do something like that. And it's very interesting when you get into this idea because you're not only monitoring like black box monitoring, you only check out what's happening from the outside, if it's giving errors or not, but you can also see and understand a lot better the health of your service. Um, for example, because you can see how much time you are spending on querying the database from a specific function or stuff like that that will tell you exactly what's going on when something goes wrong. <clears throat> so 
So that's Prometheus. Uh, it's a combination of different things that you might be used to, like uh, gathering data for graphs uh, and for analysis of errors, um, provide nice graphics, uh, provide alerts. Um, it's quite, in quite integrated, that's pretty nice. Main thing about Prometheus is that it's a very efficient store for time series data. That means data that is collected every few seconds or minutes. Um, and encourages you to get data from everything. The idea is that it's very cheap to get data, and so you can f say, give me, scrape all my targets every 15 seconds, and get like a thousand different metrics from each target, and it will cope with it. I, I've been using it in pretty small instances and can cope with um, thousands and thousands of metrics per second with no problem. Um, as because of this, that data is so cheap to, to, to read and to store, uh, encourages you to do this kind of instrumentation thing I was talking about before, so putting metrics everywhere and then collecting them, everything, and storing them on disk, even if you're not using it for any alert. The idea is that you don't start collecting data when you have an alert for it. You collect everything, and then you see what you can do with it. Um, because also you can see what happened in the past. You can analyze data from weeks or months ago, depending on your configuration. And as I said there, it has really nice graphs um, and consoles and everything, and it's very customizable, so you can sell it to your boss. <coughs> uh, intermission, since I'm in DevConf, I have to justify I'm giving this talk. <laughs> um, I started packaging this as very soon after I learned about the project, um, because I fell in love immediately. Uh, but this is written in Go. And Go is a pretty new language everywhere, it's very new to Debian. So there are many problems with that, like Go produces only static binaries. So library packaging is a bit weird, you have to package the source code, and like the policies still are being decided. The, then someday you realize that what you have been doing for the past few months has, it was wrong, so you have to change everything. So it was a lot of work. I had to package like, I don't know, 15, or 15 to 20 dependencies, I don't remember. It took me months. And the problem is that upstream is so active that every time I had almost ready a version to upload, they would release a new one. <laughs> so it, it took quite a while. So, but now it's, in, in it's unstable since like a month ago. It uh, still has an RC bug, so it hasn't migrated to testing, but it's useful. I promise. Um, but well, uh, well, yeah. Uh, the Go team is small, so if anybody's interested in Go or in Prometheus, um, come and is welcome. So let's go back to Prometheus. The architecture uh, is uh, is a bit like this. This is a graph based on on the the, the web page of Prometheus, which is. Very good because it has a lot of documentation, examples, and they, have, they also have a blog talking about best practices. So I really recommend to read all that. Sorry. <coughs> um, so it has it's the, the Prometheus is separated in, in different services, so you don't need to use everything. This is an overview of the whole system. Um, you have in this side. Uh, you have the the, um, the programs, the, system, the, service, the services that will collect your data. I will push it to the main Prometheus server that has its own storage. It uses uh, level DB for indexes and I don't remember what for the actual data, something homebrew. You have in the Prometheus server you have query interfaces. You have an API uh, using JSON and HTTP, HTTP and and consoles, and you can use this prompt dash thing that I will show later, which is a very nice uh, way to create a shiny graphs and consoles. And from Prometheus, you push alerts, ideally to Alert Manager, which is a, a service that's still a bit quite better, but uh, that will allow you to manage your alerts better, like silencing, um, defining times for different kinds of alerts, and stuff like that, so it doesn't wake you up if it's not important. Um, on this side, we have uh, the 
four main ways to to get data, which is uh, three main ways, sorry, uh, which is using the client library inside your code in your project in the service, using the node exporter, which is basically the equivalent of Nagios checks of host health, and the push gateway, um, which is an interface between uh, Prometheus and services that can only do push because Prometheus does pull. Um, so cron jobs and stuff like that. I'll talk a bit more about this. <coughs> Sorry. Um, so one of the key things about the way this is done is that the protocol is very simple. It's very easy to implement. It's just HTTP uh, gets of a, a, a URL, usually slash metrics. It's plain text. You can use protobuffers as an optimization, but it's not, it's not mandatory. This comes from former Googler, so everything is a bit biased on that side, and they use protobuf everywhere. Um, but it's just text files saying metric name, value, nothing else. And as I was saying, it's pool-based. Uh, this is source of flame wars and stuff like that, but well, it has been decided, so it's not up for discussion. I can, we can discuss all the merits of each one, but Prometheus does this because it's the, the way that allows, you, allows it to be pretty efficient and have some regularity with the metrics in chest because that's important for many calculations. And um, because also it's pretty good to have different instances of Prometheus monitoring the same thing and you can create new instances like development instances without changing any configuration in the, your service because they're just HTTP endpoints so you can scrape that from everywhere. Um, Implementation of ingestion. Uh, it's, as I was saying, it's very efficient. Can uh, can ingest hundreds of thousands of metrics, depending on your server size, CPU bound, and network bound, but mostly CPU bound. Um, the storage is very efficient. It's like we have some benchmarks in the website about comparisons with other time series databases, and with um, with a terabyte of data, you might in be able to keep the service, the the, date, the historical data for months or maybe years. Um, the retention is tunable, so you can say, well, I want to keep um, a year, 10 years, or just a week, depends on your needs, and that will define your memory and these constraints. Uh, but the thing is, the defaults are sane, which is pretty nice and uncommon. So basically, you, do, you go get the source code from upstream and builds and runs, and that's, right, and that's done. It's actually running and monitoring itself by default. And in Debian, it's doing the same thing. In fact, I added... Um, some recommended packages, which is like the node exporter and the CLI. So by default, it will monitor itself at the machine without you doing anything. And you have a nice web interface for that. <coughs> so let's talk about the, uh, the ingestion sources. Uh, I was on the left side of the graph, I was showing these four boxes. The most common one is the node exporter, uh, which is basically basic uh, host metrics. Uh, it's basically scanning slash proc for stuff. So these devices, uh, network devices, RAM usage, CPU usage, etc. And it's, it's very easy to, to extend by just writing your own metrics in a text file, and this will read it and export it. So if you want to add some stuff without much work, you just add a cron job that writes to a text file, and that's it. Then there is the push gateway, uh, which I was, I was saying is the interface to the push world, um, because for pool, you need the service to be running all the time uh, and to keep a state. So it's not suitable for crunch ups, for example, uh, or for like scripts that run in batch for a few hours and then die. So the idea is your, this kind of services will be updating data in the push gateway. Also using HTTP, they will use post instead of get, but it's basically the same thing. Um, then we have <coughs> the exporters. Uh, they have a long list of exporters already that are for different systems that um, will, will provide metrics ready to be consumed by, by Prometheus. So on the left, you have all the official, well, official to a couple of weeks ago, um, exporters, but keeps on growing all the time. And they're unofficial, they're contributed by the community. Some of them are not very usable. Some of them are production ready. You have... Um, very powerful things like GMX exported that will take all your data, the data from your Java application and export it, or the Stas D bridge, or 
the co collect the which that will allow you to migrate data from other systems easily. Um, they they have it already working for Django for your Django applications are very easy to to be monitored with this MongoDB. Uh, there's a new Relic also uh, adapter, etc. This is a lot. Um, and then the, the, the differentiator, I would say, is the, the instrumentation part, is that they provide libraries for all these languages and they're more being developed all the time. Um, and they, they, base, they pro usually provide decorators, depends on the language, of course. But in Python, for example, you just add a line to your function saying, well, measure the time this function spends every time or count the numbers of the times this function is called. And that generates a metric that then is automatically exported into a web server created by the same library. And there is also a, a few applications that we come instrumented for Prometheus, uh, in particular ETCD and Kubernetes, which is a Google application. Uh, they actually, Google is actually embracing this, this system for their public stuff. And you can also draw your own. Uh, it's very easy because it's just a text protocol, uh, an HTTP server. It's very easy to implement. Uh, whatever you want. <coughs> so this is, the, I think, the most powerful part of Prometheus is the way you can process the data. Because so far, I only talk about how to get a lot of data into Prometheus for different things, very fast, very, very often. But then you have a bunch of numbers, so you need to do something with them. Um, so they have this query language, um, which has some basic algebraic properties and, and functions, and allows you to do pretty complex calculations in real time for exploring the data, for creating graphs, for creating alerts, or for uh, creating synthetic metrics. So you say, I have this metric that is not very useful in itself, because it's coming from you know, sport, or maybe I need to combine two metrics, but I want to save a, met a new metric that's a combination of them after some calculations, so I can also do that, and this is stored as like any other metric. Um, and yeah, of course, uh, it will, that's the idea is that these calculations will trigger alerts and wake you up at 3 a.m. Uh, oh, uh, I don't think you can see anything about from that. Mm. And I cannot increase the size of phones. Maybe. Mm. Where? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you will have to believe me or look at the slides later when I have a load them. Um, this is some metrics that are coming. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah. Much better. Hope you can see anything. Um, still too small. Uh, so these are some metrics coming from the node exporter. What it says here is node underscore CPU, calibrates, and then a lot of labels. Uh, defining the, the CPU number, the instance, which is basically the host name and ports of the of the of the exporter, and then a label called mode, uh, which comes from straight from proc, which is like I idle, I await, system, user, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, these are real metrics I got from some of my servers. Uh, and the, on the right-hand side, you have the, a number, which is the number of seconds uh, spent on that mode, uh, or milliseconds, sorry. Um, and you can see this is the data model. It's a label name and then labels. And then, sorry, metric name and then labels. And it's not a string. That's something different from other systems. That it's very powerful. Um, because they are considered different dimensions, so you can you can perform operations on the based on the labels without using regexes, uh, which is very annoying when you have to do complex stuff. So you can say, well, give me stuff from the first CPU and mode idle, and that's easy to do. <coughs> so this is an example query that takes the, the data from the previous slide and does some calculations. It says sum by um, brace instance comma mode, brace, brace rate of no CPU, um, square brace one minute. What does this mean? It means take the node CPU 
metric that I shown in the previous slide, take ranges of one minute, and from that minute, calculate the rate of increase. Since the CPU counters are uh, seconds or milliseconds sped in that state per, um, since the, the, the boot time, the raw number is not useful. So you want to calculate the rate of change. Yeah. So the, the rate function will give you that. It will basically tell you how much this counter increase per second. So then in the end, that will mean how many milliseconds were spent in this state per second for the CPU metric. And then I have this sum by operator, which is an aggregator, which allows me to take different metrics and group them by, by in this case, instance or the host and, and the mode of the CPU and get sums of these rates. So what I'm getting here is that this host in the Czech Republic is having, has spent 0 0.89 seconds in the l per second. So that means 89% idle. Um, and I get the same thing for my other host um, running Prometheus. Um, so you can see it's pretty powerful, and this is like the most basic calculation you can do. You can do crazy stuff uh, with these numbers. And from this data, you create this graph. I um, this actual, the, um, actual graph created from that data is um, the different CPU states in my server, um, and you can stack it and give it nice colors. And as you can see, there is some pop-up window there. It's because the graph is all uh, render client side, so it uses some fancy JavaScript library. Um, but it just gets the data from the server and creates the graphic locally so you can explore it very easily with your mouse and get the, the exact numbers at each point in time and all that. It's, it's pretty nice, pretty useful to when you're exploring things. This is an example from a production server where I have Prometheus running. Um, this is a graph of traffic in the network interfaces, the first network interface in a, in a bunch of hosts uh, where you can see clearly the daily, the daily spikes and the weekend differences at the beginning. Um, and you can combine as many metrics as you want in one graph to be able to correlate the stuff uh, and, and deduce sources of problems and behavior. Um, this, I mean, yeah, but this thing I, I forgot to tell you. Um, all these queries I was uh, talking to you about uh, can be written in that window, at the, that box at the top. So usually you will get the numbers, as you, will see in, as you saw in the, the previous slides. But then you click on another tab and you get a graph automatically from the same thing. This is the Prometheus server interface. This is something you do interactively. But then you can have consoles, uh, which is pre-made HTML pages you, you write. Uh, that will automatically query different things and give you an overview or whatever you want to create. And in fact, it's just HTML, so you can do whatever. Um, they're pretty handy because this way uh, you can just keep them in source control, in version control, and deploy them easily, and you don't need to do anything interactively for your, your dashboards. Uh, you can include graphs, um, values, labels, alerts, status, etc. There is a there is another way to create consoles with this prompt dash, which is a separate application, separate project, which is written Rails. Um, so it's pretty awkward to install and whatnot, but they provide a Docker image, so you can just get that Docker image and run it somewhere away. It doesn't even need to be in the same server, so it's fine, um, and it's very shiny. Uh, this is well one with ba black background, and again, the console is not great, but you can see some really fancy graphs and colors that are monitoring ingested events per second, says rate limits per second, ev events ingested. So it's basically actually Prometheus data, um, because Prometheus can monitor itself. By default, it does, actually. So you get all the metrics from the Prometheus server to see how is that performing. <coughs> So alerting. Um, a monitoring system without alerts is not very useful. So Prometheus provides alerts. The idea is that you take one query, as I showed you before, and then you add some keywords around, and that converts um, 
a fa true false status in an alert. In this very simple example, you define an alert called instance down. That is defined by, um, if I should, is this the one? No. Uh, well, never mind. Um, so it says that if this query, app equals zero, app is a metric name that is, uh, in fact, is a synthetic metric that's defined as one every time the target can be reached and, and scraped for data. When it's unreachable, up goes to zero for that instance. So this query will return a value for every target you have. Uh, it doesn't need to be one, one alert per host. You just define an alert for all your hosts or all your targets. And if you say that this value is zero for five minutes, as in the third line says for five minutes, then define an alert, add some labels, in this case, the severity label, which is page. So instead of sending an email, please wake me up. Uh, and then you can add a summary and description and add um, values from, from the alert. So like the instance name, so which host is down, and you can add the value of the, of the metric, not in this case because it's just zero, but um, in this other example, you can get more stuff. Like this one is checking the latencies for HTTP requests. Um, that's a metric you, it's a, it's a um, histogram um, that's created by the client library. You, you have some functions to create the histograms easily. So it's saying that if half of my uh, requests latencies are higher than one second, so like more than a thousand milliseconds for one minute, then something's wrong with my, web, my service and I want to be alerted by that. And here the, the summary will, the description, sorry, Sorry, it will give you the instance name and then the value of the latency. So it's, that's useful. You get in your page, I was going to say I'm so old, uh, in your cell phone or whatever, you will get an, a really an informative message. Um, there is very interesting uh, blog posts and documentation of, on alerting, uh, written by these people and um, some other very intelligent people about how this is much better than trying to monitor every one, each one of your um, demons, because you don't really care if one of your, I don't know, SQL instances is down as long as the service is up. But knowing that the latencies are high is something that users can see. So this is a lot better than just monitoring up-down states for all your demons. Um, there is, with this query language, you can ask things like compare the, the current value with the, the average for the past week and take into account the standard deviation or two, stuff like that. I will not go into that because they get pretty long and they don't fit in the screen. Um, but I guess with all this, you get an idea of what Prometheus can do. Um, basically, at the end of my slides, I was speaking very fast. Uh, so I have time for questions and maybe even show you some small demo. Questions? So thank you for your talk. Pretty interesting. Um, actually, it seems to be a pretty pretty good alternative to Graphite. Mm -hmm. um, how does it store data on disk? In what format? Um, I'm not sure on all the details, but so it uses level DB, which is pretty efficient in memory. No, not in memory. Um, no, no daemon database uh, for indexes. That means the label names. Uh, to the actual storage, and then it stores, if I remember correctly, one file per, per time series, and I don't know the internal storage, it's pretty complicated. So it's uh, efficient in terms of um, size needed? It's very efficient in terms of size. Uh, they have done some comparisons with OpenTSDB and, and I think Graphite and some others, and it was performing yeah. actually very well in comparison. Um, on the other hand, what I not find really fair is to compare it against Nagios. Because yeah, it's not fair. Um, Nagios never has been about metrics, and all the perf data stuff is basically additional. And um, I, I love to use something like Graphite besides it. And um, the, the, the benefit of Prometheus would be for sure to have an um, active collection tool that does it and not relies like some application submitting to it. And um, so it would be a pretty nice addition to a 
active monitoring tool for everything. The else. DS that will replace Negios and Graphite or Moonin or whatever you're using. But also the big difference is that the alerts you can create are mo much more intelligent. Yeah, sure. Because you have access to all the data. Uh, so yeah, it's not fair to compare it to Nagios, it's true. But the thing is, many, many people are still stuck with Nagios because there's not much alternatives to it. Um, and so that's why I started the comparison with that. But yeah, it's, yeah. it's a different but, thing. But it can't really replace it all. Sorry? It can't really replace Nagios. Why not? Um, for example, checking the state of hardware on my IPMI card. On your? IPMI card. Defining what? hardware state, is the RAID controller okay, everything else. But how Nag Nagios uh, checks it? By Nagios. reading a lot of stuff via SNMP, via tools, and comparing it. And that's much more than just calculating a bit of numbers. Uh, well, you can... First, there is an, an SNMP exported that was released a few days ago. Um, still better. Uh, so you can actually get all your SNMP data. And also, the thing is, you can just take your Nagios script <coughs> and change the interface of that to instead of writing a standard output and, and uh, an exit code, mm -hmm. pushes to push gateway. As I was saying, the same value you'll get to Nagios, and you have the same alert. Tra mod um, migrating a Nagios setup to, to Prometheus is not hard because it can do everything that okay. Nagios does. Okay, thanks. So what, one of the monitoring systems that we use, um, uh, which ha is OpenNMS, you can send syslog information to that. And so if syslog alerts come in with a certain priority, you can alert on that. Can it which alerts you said, sorry? Well, it, if, if there's a log message in syslog with, yeah. with an error state, yeah. for example, um, you can alert on that. There is a, a li um, an exporter called log M or something, I don't remember. It's a Google tool that was released also months ago uh, that will, that's able to check logs, run regular expressions on them, and export metrics for Prometheus based on that, so how many errors you got and information about the error and everything. So yeah, you can get alerts and data from, from logs. Um. So it seems that, like this is a very cool tool for someone who has a day job to monitor hundreds of servers and thousands of data. But what if I have two servers with five services? And all I want is to get an email when it's down. Is it overkill to use Prometheus, or do you think it's still the um, right tool for someone like that? It's a, it's a good point. Um, if you want to use it to the full extent of it, it's complex. Um, I will not lie to you. Um, you have to code your alerts and create your consoles and whatnot. Uh, there is work on the way. In fact, I was one of the people working on that to create some ready-to-use alerts and, and expressions you can Im just import in your configuration. Um, monitoring your five servers is very easy because you can just install the node exporter, Debian package in all of them, and just add one line in the configuration for Prometheus and they are monitored. But then you need to define what to do with the data. So yes, it takes a bit of effort. Um, also, other systems take effort. You have to configure Nagios or Moonin or whatever. Um, and probably the learning curve is more steep. So yeah, it's, it's probably easier to go with Nagios. But I think the, the extra effort is worth it, especially in the long term. Other question? Yeah. Um. So I was wondering, like, how new is this project? Like, how long has it been around? And well, it has only been announced publicly in January. It's okay. very new. OK. Um, there's the people working on this have been uh, writing it for, I think, two years. They were using internally a SoundCloud. And then SoundCloud decided that, uh, well, they asked SoundCloud, and SoundCloud agreed to, to make this uh, free software. And in fact, the, the developers have a day job, which is 80% working on Prometheus. <laughs> Uh, so it's pretty good, and they're, it's been adopted quite fast by many new companies. Um, so I think it's something you can uh, really rely on. There are some parts that are, are still not production ready, like the alert manager. Uh, but the main server is stable, 
works well. I'm, I've been using it for, for a few months. Uh, and didn't have ma any major problems, except that I forgot to limit the memory usage and kill my machine, but <laughs> the details. Uh, and so how good is the documentation, like especially for creating the configuration? The so documentation is pretty good. Uh, this went into screensaver. Um, there. So if you go to the, the main website, uh, it has quite a lot of documentation here about um, every aspect of it, the query language, uh, all the definitions of the, of the data types and how to apply operators, blah, blah, blah. This, a lot of documentation is pretty complete. Um, there is things that are changing fast, uh, but the main, the main things are stable already, like the query language is stable and the API changed recently, but I think it's going to stay stable from there. Um, so I think it's something you can start using. Uh, maybe you want to keep your old monitoring system for a while, but I think it's worth to start working now on it. One last quick one. Um, so how <coughs> would, what kind of server do you need to run this, or what are the system requirements? Uh, they have some, some benchmarks somewhere, I think. But it doesn't require much. I'm running my test instance in an Atom computer with two gigs of RAM. Um, and it's not killing it, except the time I forgot that you should not store everything in memory and eat all my two gigs of RAM and there was no swap, so everything went to hell. But basically, you, you can fine tune how much to, stay, to keep in memory and that will define the memory usage. And then the CPU usage will be defined by the amount of metrics you collect and how much calculations you do each time you collect. So it's difficult to say which kind of machine you need um, because it depends on the size you're, of the things you're doing. I forgot to talk about something. Uh, I was supposed to add a slide about that, but the, something that has been released uh, recently and, and really testing it that seems to work well is Federation. Um, so the idea is that you can run different instances of Prometheus monitoring a subset of your servers or maybe you can even have duplicate setups. So you have two Prometheus servers monitoring the same thing. Uh, but then you can add a, another, another layer of, of servers, one or two or more, uh, that will monitor the other Prometheus servers and get only a subset of the data. So let's say you collect everything in the Leaf Prometheus servers, and then you run some calculations and you extract the metrics you are more, more interested in, and only one server, the, the top server will only be getting those metrics. So in that way, you spread the load and you, you scale horizontally pretty well. I just went quickly through the docs and it looks like the configuration for the Prometheus is stored in one place, which is basically the main server. So when you are in the dynamic environment, so-called cloud, and servers are coming and going, how are you going to update this configuration? The, there is a support for, I don't remember how this is called, it's somewhere in here. Um, configuration. So and the configuration is just a YAML file, uh, so you can write it by hand uh, and add all your targets by hand. Uh, but then you have support for DNS records to get the list of hosts to monitor from DNS or use just files, ex uh, files that you include and you reload automatically so you can adapt any, anything you want. Or also you can use console uh, to, get to get the list of hosts and targets. And I think etcd, a uh, zookeeper can be used too. And yeah, just files which are basically a roll your own integration for whatever you want. This all involves modifying the files on the server itself, doesn't it? Well, it depends. If you're using console or Zookeeper, uh, it will just query your Zookeeper server and ask, okay, what are the, right. what are the, the hosts I need to monitor? Or, or otherwise, you have a crunch of the rights to a file that the main configuration will import. Um, that's the easy integration, if you want. Uh, but you, you, were, you wanted to say something about this as a problem. Well, basically, what I'm using right now, something is called Sensu. It's not... It's the software which has been designed for dynamic environments. Its main communi communication bus is over the RabbitMQ. Mm -hmm. So whenever the host is coming up, it's basically signing up to the queue, sending message, 
and that's it. And that communication, this communication channel is basically for everything. So it's for signing up, mm -hmm. for delivering information and everything. Yeah, Which well, for something like that, you can either r extend this to, to talk to your service, you could do it, like, or ask the developers to do it. Maybe they will be interested. Um, if it's widely used, or otherwise you write a crunch of that every minute or five minutes, whatever, queries this and writes the file with the host. Um, it's a compromise in that sense. Um, we have four minutes, I don't know if there are more questions. Uh, when you did the, when you did the uh, initial packaging, which criteria did you use for all this Go uh, dependency, either to put it uh, embedded or ah. to create a separate package? Because I want to package something in Go Packer, and uh, it has also this 15 dependencies, and I don't yes. know where to start with that. Well, that's a, a, a big problem with Go. Yeah, uh, upstream tends to vendor everything. Uh, not every Go upstream does that, but um, the Prometheus people want to have very stable dependencies, so they vendor everything into the source tree, or almost everything. Uh, my criteria was was to, like, everything that was reusable for any other project, I will separate, remove it from the source package, and create a new, a new Debian package from that. Uh, but then I had some dependencies that were just too small, to, uh, or just too specific to be useful for other projects, so I left them embedded. I guess it's the, yeah, you have to, to evaluate how much use other people could have of that. And also how big is the dependency, how many, how, mu how often does it get updated for security issues or whatever. So some dependencies might, are better to be packaged separately. Also there's internal dependencies like Prometheus has, I don't know how many repositories of different libraries and parts of the system. Um, and I package them all separately. <coughs> so there is code reuse, otherwise like every Prometheus tool will have to bend vendor the same core libraries. So yeah, mostly I separated. Only things that were one or two files I left in embedded. Any question? Um, we don't have much time. Um, Uh, yeah, well, that was, I will not be able to show you much, but this is an actual Prometheus server that's monitoring my, my home instance. It's running in a very, in a very small server, and these are actual metrics from now, and this corresponds to uh, HTTP requests from the, prom the Prometheus server and the push gateway and the node exporters. So this is, was from, uh, in fact, from the sample slide. Here, if I can reach it, um, is this slide here? Is this query here? Uh, this something I didn't show you, which is using regular expression matching on the labels. So in this case, what I'm trying was trying to do is to uh, only get the error codes for HTTP requests instead of all the counters. So I was saying like all the all the, the, the codes that start with 405, basically, 400, 500, et cetera. And I get, no, not this one. So I get here, um, what am I doing here? Hold on. This, oh no, this is a mixture. <laughs> Got it wrong, sorry. Bad copy paste, there. So executing the query right now, and it failed, oh well. Demos always fail, so forget it. <laughs> <laughs> the idea was I could show you some nice stuff here. Um, I get some data here. I will process it. I will not do it now, but then once you have the data as you want it, you click here on graph, and you get automatically a graph, and you can see all the, all the graph is dynamic. I can change the range, one hour, two hours, one week, two weeks. I can go back in time. You see, tell me what happened a week before. Um, you cannot see much of the graph. Here I have the labels for all the data. I can select one and just show that and nothing else. So the graph, the graph explorer is pretty nice. And I'm out of time, so just wanted to give you 
a proof that this works because all the other content was static. Um, so well, I think that's it. Thank you for coming, and I hope you can you you will dare to try it, even if it takes some effort. <laughs>